My name is Charles Kidega Ochaya. I'll be taking you through principles of marketing, PMKG 111. We start off by looking at the very important concept in marketing. This is known as the marketing mix. Uh, also, sometimes I'll describe it as the four P's of marketing. Essentially, it's about product, price, place, and promotion. Most of the marketing that happens in the world will revolve around these four elements. In addition to product, product marketing, you also have services marketing. When you're dealing with services marketing, you have to take account of physical evidence, process, and people. In this presentation, we shall focus on product marketing. However, you must be aware that for services marketing, you need physical evidence. Now, physical evidence refers to any kind of evidence that will show that you are there, you have an office, and uh, you are there not as a fake company, but as a real company that exists. Probably you have a front office with receptionists, and you are selling a service. Uh, and then also processes will have to be clear to the customer or the consumer on how you go about delivering your services. And then people as well must be there to show that you're delivering a service. Maybe you're selling a policy, but uh, sales managers are there or sales consultants are there. And these are the people who drive your sales. Now, going back to the four P's, product comes on top because everything revolves around product. The nature of the product is something of value which consumers are willing to pay for. This is what product is all about. Now, marketers define product as being a bundle of benefits. This means that the product is more than just the sum of its physical characteristics, right? Uh, when you go into this idea, you realize that when you, you have core attributes, what they call core attributes, just like when you say you have a car or you compare different cars, you find that they all do the same thing. The core feature is that they will transform one place to the other. But when you go for now, there will be other attributes like color, speed, and things like that. Those, are, those tend to be additional to the core feature or the core quality of being able to move you from one place to the other. Okay, So marketers define products and they also look at uh, the physical attributes, attributes, some other qualities which are very important. So it includes fringe elements such as brand image, the way the product is packed, packed and delivered, even the color of the box it's in. Many products are so similar to manufacturers' products, to other manufacturers' products, that consumers are entirely indifferent as to which one they will buy. In other words, they cannot sometimes differentiate one product from the other. If you don't make an effort, they will just spend on in a haphazard way. But now, being a marketer, you want to channel your customers, you want people to come and buy your products. right? That is why, if you look at a a product like petroleum. You have different companies that sell petroleum. Uh, you have Shell, you have Puma, you have BP, 
and so on. There's so many. But the essential commodity there is petroleum. They all work the same way at the end of the day. When you're dealing with product, you will also be discussing product positioning. Now, product positioning is about establishing the product in the consumer's perceptual map, in a position relative to other products. We looked at this idea of perceptual map some time back, where we drew a cross and we had different segments, different quadrants where we'd be placing the products, okay, in terms of price, in terms of quality as well. How do consumers perceive the product, right? If it's a pair of shoes, is it uh, a very expensive brand and of high quality and very expensive, or is it something cheap and not very expensive and not very durable? So that is very important. Their perception, what they think about the product is what you're trying to influence. Now, also, there's a cautionary note at the bottom there, which says that, well, if you're a marketer or you're a producer and you are selling to a customer some concept, a product, but the product does not have all what you promised, all the qualities that you promised, then there will be dissatisfaction, there will be frustration, the customer will be frustrated and in psychology this is what is called cognitive dissonance. Okay, They become dissonant, in other words they become uh, disturbed mentally because uh, you've uh, disappointed them. Right? It is not a good thing because the customer will not come back you will also send a wrong message, a bad message about your products, right? So you want to avoid cognitive dissonance. Now, when you're dealing with uh, products, you realize that some products are branded, others are not branded. Like I already said, a, it's a matter of differentiation. A branded product is highly differentiated, meaning that they will try to make the product look different to the minds of the buyer. Okay, high differentiation. Uh, maybe if it's a suit, they will call it Carducci, a brand, um, an Italian brand, and rather than just an ordinary suit. But because of the brand, people will associate Carducci with high quality suits products, shoes, and things like that, right? So the level of differentiation is very important uh, to appreciate. Now, branding draws on several things. Uh, as you can see, on the right side, you are trying to tell the customer that if you buy this branded product, you will have better self-image. You will look good, right? It will be a product of quality. You are dealing with Carducci, you are dealing with uh, Pierre Cardin. These are quality products. Or, uh, and it's expensive, the price. The price, some people will all buy based on price. They will not buy something cheap because they'll suspect that it's not of good quality. So the cost also matters. Uh, then the expected performance, durability, can it last or can it not last? What will happen to it? And then the actual uh, differentiating from the other products, your competitors' products, like the coloring, the branding, the texture, and all that also matters. So from the consumer's point of view, those points on your right will kind of is what the consumers are looking for. Right? Now, from the producer point of view, they'll give the product, of course, they'll give the place where to find the product and how to find it. They will tell about the price, uh, how much it is, they'll set the price, they will promote, create awareness 
using the many channels that they have they will have people if it's a service there will be frontline staff there will be sales people rev reps and so on to help support the selling of that service the processes would have been outlined the steps will be clear on how they deliver the service because it's a service uh, and then anything to support to show their presence also will be there so now when the two match uh, they will actually actually form some kind of brand the way things are done from the company side in terms of marketing okay to try and attract the customers now having dealt with product which is the central issue under discussion we now have to look at pricing more carefully generally there are three approaches used when pricing uh, you can identify cost based pricing you can identify consumer based pricing and finally you can identify competition based pricing so whatever the name or there's so many different names for pricing approaches strategies but they can be grouped into these three broad uh, classes now when you're dealing with cost-based pricing here you start off by looking at the cost maybe it was the cost of producing that product at the factory how much did you spend on the workers on electricity overheads how much did you spend to actually bring the product uh, to manufacture the product so when you now find out you are now sure of the total cost per unit on each and every car that comes out from the assembly line you can then say well based on that cost we need to put a certain percentage on top of that cost right and that will be a markup on that. Uh, and then under cost-based pricing, there's also another approach where they look at the margins. Okay, here the focus is on the the selling price uh, and not on the cost of production. Uh, the other approach uh, is called consumer-based pricing. Right? you focus on the consumers needs you want them to keep on buying uh, and then you you set your price accordingly by gauging the reaction from the consumers one of them is known as customary pricing uh, here the idea is to try and keep the custom to try and keep the tradition if you've already always charged say 100 puller for a certain product so be it it will continue to be 100 uh, then you will try to by all means minimize, minimize all the other costs involved with supplying that product there is an example that is given of say those old telephone booths or the kiosks where the coin slot would always be the same the coin slot would always be the same they wouldn't modify it if it was uh, a pull one puller it will always be one puller but then the cost of delivering the service would try to be they would try to lower that there's also another pricing consumer based pricing which looks at scheming it's called scheming it's where the prices start off very high or high but then they are lowered gradually over, over time you are scheming and depending on the products where it is in the life cycle in its life cycle you will then do scheming accordingly for example if the product has just been introduced into the market you will probably start off with a high price because not everyone has that product and then gradually over time you begin to lower prices as more and more people have the product now and then the market is becoming more saturated 
So skimmings can be used at entry level. You also have competition based. Here the pricing tries to look at the competition. What are your competitors doing? How are they pricing? Uh, one example is that of uh, penetration pricing. Here you want to gain a market share to have a foothold in that market. Right? You're selling a commodity, you're an entrant into the market, you cannot afford to put very high prices. So to gain access, you need to lower, keep lower prices. This is what you're calling penetration pricing. You want to penetrate the market. There is also predatory pricing. This one is a, a kind of a strategic approach to marketing or pricing whereby you want to outperform your competitors to drive the to drive them out of the market. If you can do that persistently for a very long time, you'll be able to drive your competitors out of the market. Uh, under World Trade Organization rules, uh, sometimes they will take countries that do this to task, whereby if you try to undercut or underprice in other destinations, uh, that will be you'll be sanctioned for that. Now the other element from the marketing mix is that of place. Okay. Well, place can also be a geographical location in the geographical location where your business is located, where you serve your customers from. Also, but there's also a meaning which speaks about the distribution of the product and how consumers will get access to it. Remember that consumers always want the product at the right price, at the right time, and at the right place, okay, to keep them happy. So here now you are trying to deliver the product to the final user, the consumer, using various channels. So we shall look at that in the next. Right, these are the channels of distribution. Uh, you will notice that there are three of them here. In the first one, you can see there are so many intermediaries from the producer, maybe at the factory. Okay, they do production on a large scale. They are focusing on production. Then you may then have wholesalers, those who buy in bulk, large quantities, maybe jumbo, and curry, and so on. They buy in large quantities, and then they they have a warehousing, a warehouse. They store all that. They buy in bulk. Then you have retailers. These are smaller outlets, smaller shops, which will then sell directly to the consumer. Okay. So from the producer to the consumer, you can see there are at least two intermediaries. Those who facilitate in delivering the product to the consumer. Uh, in the second scheme, you can see that the producer sells directly to the retailer. There is no wholesaler. So in this case, the consumer, uh, there is a middleman that has been removed. The wholesaler is out of the picture. And here it's from the producer to the retailer to the consumer. So the channel is shorter. Is not as long as the first one. Then finally, there's also the third one. The producer can sell directly sometimes to the consumer. Right? Now, when you're dealing with distribution and distribution channels, you will come across these concepts or these ideas to evaluate the channel in terms of how effective it is in getting the product to the consumer at the right time 
Look at retail concentration. Look at channel length. Look at channel ex exclusivity. Look at the channel quality. Okay. So a distribution strategy decision attempts to find the best channel for delivering a product to the consumer. You want to keep costs down. You need the consumer to receive the commodity faster and also to you should be able to convey as safely as possible so those are some of the qualities of a good channel now retail concentration speaks about how many uh, retailers you have in the market if it's it can either be concentrated or it can be fragmented now when it's concentrated it means there's so many sellers maybe so many retailers so many people selling products at retail level okay for example you may have pick and pay shop right uh, shop right choppies and so on so many and even others who actually don't use shops like that tax shops and so on so if it's like that you will say it is highly concentrated there are so many retailers you could also have a system which is fragmentary fragmented which means that they are scattered they are not many okay they are not many and no one seller has a large share of the market okay if you have a very large outlet where everyone buys from that place and no other then it will be a system which is highly concentrated and uh, it would be a bit more like a monopoly of some now channel length is about the number of intermediaries that a product has to go through before it reaches the final consumer you can have a short channel or you can have a long channel okay you remember the scheme the diagram that I drew above where you could either have producer to um, wholesaler and then to the retailer that is a longer channel than the other one channel exclusivity speaks about a, a situation where you have one person who only sells for another major producer for example if you say the only distributor for KL is Saikwana then it means they have they have exclusive rights to distribute KBL products so two companies can link up or they can form an, an alliance an agreement especially when you're dealing with international marketing where you are trying to get access into another country and establish a foothold there channel quality speaks about the expertise of people who are in the uh, the, in the chain within that distribution channel of course you would have retailers you'd have wholesalers you'd have uh, uh, those who are dealing with transportation and so on if these people are highly competent if they are professionals then you are going to have to talk about it being a quality channel so if a producer has lots to sell he must make sure that the channel is that of quality or else he will struggle to, to actually be operational now the when it comes to choosing a transportation method these are some of the things you need to consider okay for example you need to consider the nature of the product right 
if you are distributing a product think about it is it something which is perishable is it something that can be stored is it something that needs to be put in refrigerated trucks is it something that is fragile like glass how do you transport it you know when you're doing glazing you can only store us in a certain way and use special trucks modified trucks to take those uh, those glasses somewhere right also think about the methods used by the competition uh, what how do they what channels do they use are they using large cars, heavy trucks, or are they using motorbikes, motorbikes, and so on? You have sea, you have land, and also uh, the time that they take to deliver a product also varies according to the mode of reliability. Is it 100% reliable? If you need to deliver a product somewhere that have, has to arrive regardless, then you need to have a very secure channel. It could be confidential or classified products or you know regulated and so on. Then you need secure channels. All right. Again, that issue of security at the bottom there. High value items may not be easily distributed through retailers. You can't post something through the post box, which is very, very sensitive. In short, channel intermediaries such as transporters, warehouse distribution centers, wholesale retailers help to firstly sort out the products. They sort out the products, they label them, they put tags on them, you know, identification tags which the computer can identify, the destination, and then and so on. Just like mail, when you have to mail something, you need to uh, code them nicely. They also help to accumulate in terms of storage. Some warehousing, as you know, warehouses will have a large store where they will store products. They may be specialists just in storage. Okay, and then you will uh, rent the space there. And then after that, some other people uh, in that distribution channel are good at allocation. They will allocate, they will distribute, they know their geography very well so the location they have maps they have uh, tracking systems GPS tracking systems satellite tracks and so on then they are able to distribute efficiently and others are good at assorting in other words they accumulate an assortment of commodities they stockpile whatever you need they could have a variety of consumer goods, right? Like in stores, where you go and buy almost everything that you need will be there under one roof. So that is assorting. Now, again, coming back to the four Ps, promotion is one of the important components of the mix. Here it's about, uh, especially it's about pull and push strategy. How do you want to market your product? Is it going to be using a selling concept where you pro push the product to the consumer, go door to door and using, using your sales team, you try to target as many people as possible? Or is it going to be a pull strategy where you want to create awareness you are targeting a segment and you want people to come and buy your products so you need to then formulate a very good <coughs> strategy in order to attract customers uh, in all of this when you're doing promotions you also have to deal with 
communication. Now, you have to deal with the promotional mix where public relations is important, personal selling, sometimes you need to do personal selling, sales promotions like um, KBL does promotions like that, then advertising policy. How and where do you place your adverts? You need to think about that. Finally, the communication cycle is uh, very important. The communication that you studied in BCOM 101, where you can see the barriers to communication. What is it that hinders communication? So as a promotional expert, someone who knows about 4Ps in promotion, you must be alive to these problems. You must know that uh, if the sender does not code the message properly, if he does not write the correct message in clear language, it will be misunderstood. So the message must be spot on. The channel that is used, are you using radio, are you using television, are you using uh, loudspeakers, or is it going to be newspapers or magazines or billboards? So you must use the right channel for the right segment so that you can actually get the right, uh, get the customers buying from you. Then from the receiver's point of view, the potential customer. Remember that they have to decode your message, which should have been clear in the first place. They will have to decode it, meaning that they have to uh, decipher it. They'll have to unpack it and understand it for what it is. Then thereafter, they can give you feedback. They'll tell you, they'll call you back, they'll ask you questions, you know, they'll ask for clarifications. This is now the feedback loop to the communication cycle and all the while while the sender and the receiver are trying to communicate remember that uh, you always have interference what they're calling noise right distractions anything that hinders good communication between the sender and the receiver is considered to be noise it is unwanted communication that can be sent so you as a promotions expert should also be aware that other factors can also come into play and interfere with your message. And finally, the context is also important. Uh, when, where, how, for whom, and so on. Uh, I give you this assignment, uh, which will be graded as well. Briefly outline and explain the extended marketing mix for services. For a product or service of your choice, show how the importance of the marketing mix elements helps to make the product successful. Thank you so much.